Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So my name is Abdul Rahman and uh, I have with me uh, Hafiz uh, Tamim. Uh, we both are from Fremont and we are part of, uh, we are volunteers at the Islamic uh, Society of East Bay, which is where we have the Ghusl facility and we have been uh, offering Ghusl service for many, many years. And uh, so we basically assist the family members to give Ghusl. And this workshop basically is to go over uh, the practical, you know, way of giving ghusl and then the kafan, which is called shrouding. So we'll go over the washing and sh shrouding. You know, within, uh, I have a mannequin, a homemade mannequin here that we would use. And inshallah, after that, maybe, um, so even before going there, uh, let's, let's look at the facility so you get an idea uh, what happens within a a Ghusl facility. So this is the facility we have at the Lowry Mosque in the Islamic Society of East Bay. It's a it's a room here at the corner of the back of the building and uh, inside the room is a very clean sanitary sanitized uh, room which has um, the facility for the water, the ventilation and you know all the basic features. They are tiled so it can be cleaned up very well and this is the table this is the table that we use and if you look at the table uh, it's not too close uh, you can see there is a pathways on the side basically for the water to flow from the top of the head to all the way to the bottom and and this table is generally kept close to the sink so there is a hot there's a hole at the bottom by the leg so all the water that we pour in they just go through the sideways and get um, you know um, uh, into the sink that goes into the sink and basically the facility has three cold storage but we we could use only two because the one on the top is too too close to the um, too too top that it's very hard to carry the the deceased from the top shelf but we most of the time use the two the bottom and the center one and also we have this six uh, kind of a um, hooks here with a, with, a, with a machine that can lift up to 1,000 pounds of an individual if you want to airlift him and place the, uh, place the box under him. So we have that facility. And so this is the basic, uh, uh, basic facility for, for the Gosul. Um, now I'll come back to the symmetry later. I think with this said, uh, is there any any specific questions that you would like to know? I mean, just I want to get a feel of have anyone participated in a ghusl before? You have participated, and you have participated in the ghusl. Uh, any specific questions outside of those? And like anything that you want to know more, or specifically, yeah. Yeah. Okay, what is the process in general? That's a good question. Cost is a good question. Um, so let us go over the practical aspects first, and then we'll go into the and into the process, the cost, and what it takes. And uh, basically, there are kinds of uh, you know you have adult uh, who passes away, then you have infants who pass away, and then you also have a category of stillbirth and miscarriage that happens within the womb of the mother. So we'll try to cover all four of them. Uh, and also California uh, has a facility for uh, in a doctor induced you know, kind of a abortion where if the, if the baby is not really doing well or it's harmful for the mom, then the doctor can initiate and that option is also available in California. So we'll go over that after the practical aspects of washing and shrouding. So with that said, I have Tamim with me to just assist and also he could answer any questions as well. So we both are, have been doing this for some time. Now basically when most of the cases, when an adult comes in, uh, we have to make sure one key thing that we have to make sure uh, when they come here is, or most of, the, most of the time they come from the hospitals and they are double bagged. And most of them are, they pass away for various reasons and they have tubes running everywhere. So always I tell the parents or anyone uh, to make sure that you take the help of the hospital and the nurse to take away all those tubes that you don't need, you know, 
that you want to free from the deceased before even bringing it here because we are no experts on medical experts on how to take those um, those tubes largely it is intravenously they are fed through you know intestine or through chest or it could have a, a trachea tube which is hard to take it out and uh, sometimes we end up burying the individual with that you know because we don't know how to take it out so that's something to keep in mind so with that said when the deceased comes in a double bag it's all double bagged and uh, you know it, either it could come from a coroner's office because it was an unnatural death it was a car accident so it would go to coroners it would come from coroners it could come from home or it would come from hospital so with that said uh, we'll get started so so the first thing what we uh, do is we make an intention nia we oh we encourage all the family members to participate it is their rights to do the gusul for the for their you know near and dear yes please yes 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 before starting yeah it's recommended to all of us to have wudu even though the gusul itself is in a, in a he is in an uh, the mayit or the deceased itself is in an impure state but we recommend everyone including i and, and the, you know to have wudu and for women right they have to be outside of the menstruation cycle to participate in the gusul for women so basically wudu is recommended we if we ask you know everyone to be in wudu and then they if not they make wudu and come in so before even starting that's a good point so everyone is in a state of wudu and everyone is wearing an apron basic gloves masks you know head covers shoe covers all those basic things all the individuals and the family members are recommended to participate we encourage all the time because this is the last opportunity the family members have to do khidmat or to you know help him leave this world you know so we encourage we take five to six people from the family members it could be as small as the child who participates could be as small who who can reason and who who knows who can handle it you know so all of welcome we encourage even you folks if you know any one of your friends uh, passing away you are more welcome to come in and participate in the gusul we encourage all the family members and the friends so with that said couple of things that we follow or the process that is followed before the start itself is there is no recitation of quran while doing gusul there is no recitation of quran we make dua uh, all the time we say allahumma ighfir lahu wa la forgive him and we also it could say forgive us you know for our any shortcomings so so first uh, rule is no recitation of quran within this place of uh, in a gusul the second important thing is the 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 satar is we tell that the satar would be always covered for the mayit the satar for men is from the navel below all the way below the knee so the satar is always covered and from start to end till the kafan anything we do we do under the covers of the satar um the third thing we say is uh, any you know for the people who are participating any uh, 40 major sins are forgiven for people who are participating in the in the gusul with a condition that any imperfections or shortcomings that we see of a mayit we keep it to ourselves till we die we don't share is it good so we make sure um um what does it say uh yes the, no no yeah yeah any kind of imperfections or shortcomings we see we keep it to ourselves we don't share or discuss that with our spouse or children or parents any good things can always be shared with the people you know about the noor and whatever they want it's, but any kind of a thing you like blood if it is a coroner's case it will be autopsy done so it will have a cut open um, soon uh, sewed sewed the body so those kind of things sometimes missing part so those kind of things you keep it to yourself any kind of imperfection you keep it to yourself still it has an amana until you die and with that said the hadith says 40 major sins are forgiven so so that's one of the key things and whatever we do the satar right we are not supposed to see the private area uh, while giving gusul so we have to keep our gaze in such a way that we don't see the private parts the private parts basically the front and the back and um, 
and how we cover it is we make sure that the covering the satar cover is good enough that we don't give opportunity for the people to gaze at the private parts uh, with that said any other uh, conditions any other things ah, so we make the deceased you know face in such a way for example the head is this way right we make it sure that the, the right side is facing the qibla you know or the leg is facing the qibla that's how we place the deceased because the hadith says the qibla for the living and the dead is a kaaba you know facing the mecca so with that those are the criteria and the first thing we do after that is to place him on the table and undo all his clothes with the satar covered so with the satar covered um, we basically make sure we turn him and make sure all the covering coverings any kind of a bandage everything is taken out whatever is removable is removed now i think you had a question yeah yeah if it is a yeah if it is a male sorry if it is a male all male and so women all women okay if it is a non bolic bolic child means if a child is not come of age then a dad or mom can can give ghusl but largely we have never seen a case where it's a mixed gathering or it's a mixed thing we have we have been asked by the family members that they would like to see their son or their husband uh, you know before the ghusl so we encourage them to you know all the mahrams to come and see the deceased but once the ghusl starts and the people who are uh, offering the ghusl uh, or the washing is basically the closest if it is a son it would be his dad brother uncles all the closest to one because we tell them some people are scared and we say no please come because you will regret later that you didn't you didn't you know get to do that you know and so um, so 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 that answering your questions uh, and if none of them are there most likely there are a lot of family and friends sometimes some dad may not have a son you know so their brothers or closest family friends or the most pious person can come and give and we are there worst case we are able to help so with that said the satar is covered and the satar is from the uh, so so yeah please yeah the generally you know if a person is even before the in the stage uh, at the time of you know close to the time of death we generally the the scholars generally recommend the deceased to be placed not deceased even if then he is still close to his death to place always facing the qibla head facing lift the head and move it use left a little bit you will be facing like so even if the leg is yeah you yeah and and generally the head is above the pillow you know so it's little bit up and even if it's facing the qibla it's still good good so those are the basic things we follow even prior to a death you know um, you know things keep the room clean you know menstrual menstruating women are prohibited it's avoiding them to come in reading surah yasin all these things are good things to happen and keeping the room clean you know angels come in when the ruh is taken out angels come in so we we do the best to keep the deceased in a, or or even you not know, almost ill person to be in a clean state clean bed sheets clean covers you know space around and always surya yasin you know, or something is going on so that the individual has a, a inkling to recite those uh, you know you know shahada before passing away so with that said so we 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 start with undoing all the cloths with the satar covered so there will be two two uh, two turkey towels generally we use one vertical horizontal so it's completely it's not too thin so you can look at the you know get an appearance of the of the private area but we just uh, double cover it and um, and before starting before starting the the ghusl the first thing we do is press the abdomen three times and to do that we just lift the mayit to a not i mean to a very comfortable position not too high not too low just a position so that any kind of an impurities are coming out with the pressure that we give they come out 
through the front and the back. So, so before even istinja starts, we start with the pressing the abdomen. And this happens after undoing all the cloths and all the, all the, all the uh, bandages are removed and then the satar is completely, with the satar completely covered, we start with that. And now we start with istinja. So like any gusul, juma gusul or any kind of a gusul, or even for a wudu, right? We always have to make sure all the impure areas are cleaned up before giving wudu. It's in the same thing. So even even for a gusul, juma gusul, or any kind of a gusul, the first thing is to istinja, which is any dirt in the private parts. We just clean up all those, and then if anything in the face, you know, like you know, due, due to steroids or any kind of a thing, you could have blood stains on the face. We clean up all the dirt areas so that we are in a position to give wudu. So the first step we do is istinja. And for istinja, the rule is, what we, we, recommend, we say is, we use a small turkey towels and we cover the finger, the hand that is giving, that is doing the cleaning part. The idea is, we should not, or the individual should not feel the private parts with the finger. And they have to have some cloth just because modesty is utmost importance, uh, even here and even in Jannah. So we use these kind of small clothes and to basically use that with water and soap solution. And we, we basically have four people lifting up, lifting up the cloth, you know, so, so that you have ample uh, uh, space um, uh, around the private area. We spread the legs. We spread the legs so that we have a lot of clearance. And the individuals start with, you know, you know, clean up on the on the private area. So, so we do that, and uh, and how we know that it is dirty is either you have stain in the in the cloth, or you can see from the water that there is some stain. So you keep and throw away these small turkey devils and keep on uh, using as many as you need till to a point where the water is clean, and so there is no dirt and the and there is no stain on the. So, so basically on the cloth. So there. So basically we cover the front first, and once the front part is completely done, we make sure all the groin area and all the difficult areas around it is completely clean as well, because this is the only opportunity you get to clean up, and not just the istinja part, but we use a new cloth and just clean up everything, and then we go to the back side. And the rule with any my any gusul, even at home, is right side first. When we put shirt or pant or any kind of a thing, shoes, we always use right. So the same rule here, always do the right first and then the left. So we turn him to his left so that the right side, now with the satar covered still, with few people holding the cover, you go and then clean up the back side. And sometimes we just have to lift the leg so there is enough clearance so one person can put his you know, kerchief and cloth and go and clean up his backside. So once he's cleaned up on the on that side of the back, we also clean up the lower back. So the lower back is all clean. And the same thing is done from the other side, from the right side. So it could be, generally if it is a dad, it will be the children, you know, who is doing this, istinja and all these things. Our brothers, closest ones are the doing it. And if they can't do it, we are there to do it. So basically, again, we cover on the other side. So two, two, two times in the back. And with that, basically istinja will be complete with the lower back as well. We use a different cloth, fresh cloth, to clean up the lower backs because sometimes have a, you know, bed sores and things. We do it very gently. We tell them don't put, don't put too much of, uh, you know, uh, pressure into cleaning, just gentle so that the skins are still, and it's like how we feel it, you know, we, how we feel it's the same thing. And even, even the water we use should be lukewarm, like how when we take shower, we feel good feeling with the kind of water we have. See, the thing is, even though the, the roux is still alive and the, the deceased can still feel everything what or can hear and listen to, to what we are standing around and speaking. So we have to treat him still as a living person kind of a thing, like give a care as though how we feel when we give shower, right? So it should be lukewarm water, not extreme hot, not extreme cold, lukewarm water. So with that said, istinja will be complete. Okay. Now, even before giving wudu, which is the next step, so there are only three things, istinja, wudu, and body bath. These are the three main things, you know, like with any, any gusul, any gusul, like juma gusul or whatever it is. Uh, the key thing is, 
while we have done the istinja, there are there may be stains on his face or nostrils. So what we do is we take cotton swabs, cotton swabs, just wet it up and put it through the nose and clean up the nostrils, nostrils, the face, the ears and the mouth. All these things are cleaned up a bit. So we have this cotton balls. We can just use cottons and just clean up all the all the dirt areas. So he is prepared to give wudu. Okay. So now that the istinja is done, at this point we tell them to take away their gloves because istinja is you know because of the dirt. And if the if the turkey towels are dirty, now we can replace with a fresh set of turkey towels. So we replace the new set of turkey towels and this one we give uh, vadu. Vadu is very straightforward. We do a farai the vadu, but we still some people like to wash their hands kind of a thing. So we start off with the right hand, kill all of the fingers, left hand, kill all of the fingers. But basically the most key thing is starting with the face, which is the, the most important thing. So the ear, ear lobe to ear lobe and from the top till the bottom of the beard, every part of the face is completely wet and clean. So, and three times we do the vadu of the face. With that, um, with that done three times, we do the right hand three times from uh, between again, kill all the fingers, everything, all the way above the elbow on the right three times and then on the left three times. And then masa of the head. You just give a masa of the head one time. And with that done, we do the right leg. Again, kill all the fingers from the little finger all the way to the big toe and from big toe to little finger. Okay, so again, right first and then left. So that's that's as simple as that. So with that, the wudu is complete. So when you do the face, the nose is already, we, oh, when you say kulli and, and putting it into the mouth, water into the mouth, right? It's not necessary. So what happens is, um, only in a certain specific cases we do it. In the state of Janabat, we have to clean up the mouth. But generally, right, even the lips and the teeth, we, we clean up. We clean up the lips and teeth. But most of the time, right, the rigor mortis sets in, right? It's already hard. You can't even open the, the mouth, mouth, you know, in some cases. But in the even in the cases where rigor mortis is not set, we just make sure the lips are wet and the teeth are cleaned up, but we don't put like how we gargle to give wudu. We don't do that kind of a thing with the nostrils. We, we don't do that, except in the state of Janabat, they say, uh, otherwise we don't do. We just wipe on the top, whatever is possible. So with that done, and in the, in the masa also, right, the masa, the quarter of the head is what is required. You don't have to do the full masa, but some people are emotional. They try to do, they like to do the whole thing with the back of the ear masa. We just let them do it. But it is just like any wudu. It's not. So basically, the wudu is complete. At this point, uh, um, no body bath. Body bath again three times on the right side, three times, I mean, right first and left first. So we have three people. We just start with the face, the arm, armpit. Every corner of the body has to be wet. And three times with, with soap or without soap. So basically, we start with the right side. So one person is doing the face, one is doing the chest and one is, can do the, the leg, the whole thing. But whenever you are doing the private parts, we use the turkey towel or the towel to cover so we don't feel the private parts. Modesty is important again. And then we tilt him to his left and give a bath in the back. Again with the turkey towel, with the, with the satar completely covered. And we bath on the right side completely three times. And then we do the same thing left side three times. After this, so after this, we press the abdomen three more, three more times. Yeah, this is a masnoon step. It doesn't mean that if something comes out, we have to do vadu again. No need of giving vadu, but we just run water, but we press the abdomen as a step. And the last step is we put, we put uh, um, bay leaves or, yeah. Yeah, we can do another towel. And we, the last step is to wash with uh, water with camphor. We use sometimes camphor or bay leaves powder. So for people who don't know what camphor is, they can just sniff it. You can just sniff it. It's too powerful. It's too pungent. What it does is it's a disinfectant and also it gives... 
mothballs and um, you know it has that kind of a very pungent strong flavor but it takes away any odor that the yeah so so what we do is we add this powder into the water or bay leaf powder or any kind of a thing which has same properties and we run on top of them three times and that completes washing that completes washing all while we have been saying allahumma kfir lahu allahumma kfir lahu we keep reminding allahumma kfir lahu allah forgive him forgive him any kind of a bad smell or anything that is there it will it will it'll take it away it will absorb it's just um, uh, it's one of the things that we use and with that said we with the, the only thing that is left out is to dry him up and we use again fresh towels to dry everything bottom back everything with the satar covered with the satar covered so that completes washing so who could summarize me and <laughs> very simple you know the you know at least in the basic three things they can summarize with you know like how any time we do a wudu so can can you summarize just istinja yeah a uh, wudu after istinja wudu second is wudu and then body bath body bath so basically impure all the impurities are removed with istinja and face and everything wudu is the second step and third step is giving a washing and then we use some the scam for water at the end to clean up and in between we press the abdomen we start with pressing the abdomen three times so the any impurities comes out we do it once more time and that's it Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. 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 So, because we have three steps, so the intention is that we only reset one time in the beginning, or we need to reset like Allah wudu. Allah. For example, like wudu, we need to reset the when we. We do don't we don't recite the, the oh, dua okay. for the gusu wudu. Yeah. Mean the dua we don't for the, need, yeah. we don't, we oh, we don't, don't need do to do that. that. All along we just say Allahumma kfir lahu. The niyat is at the start of from the beginning. Yeah. At the beginning that for the sake of Allah Taala we are mm. giving uh, gusul washing to this mayut. Okay. okay And then it. the next question is about um, you know that uh, there is like the the blood disease right like it's IV or something like that. So when we have to do something like that. do we need to get like information the reason of the death of for example disease or whatever something like that because when we touch something blood for example right yeah, yeah. and then this is uh, like something dangerous for yeah it is infectious people. okay so when a, when a person is released from the hospital generally they give in a piece of paper that he is highly uh, infectious or if it is um, um, something blood contagious disease, yeah. if it is very contagious okay so there are there have been instances where covid is on classic yes. example yeah. where it yeah. was it was a difficult we never knew what it was so in those cases we have just given um, in the earlier days of covid extreme cases they have they have just taken the bar, the deceased and put it in the in the grave but our scholars say at least we have to run water once mm. on the deceased so so there were instances where we have just buried they were double bagged because even the bags were contagious you know even for the individual and we never had any kind of an equipment to you know protect ourselves because our protection is also important and leave alone the disease so so when we never had the proper ppe uh, protection um, uh, you know things with us in the initial days so but but we took over them there were few brothers who were able to come up and do cover their uh, with a kn45 or a high level mask and we were able to do it during the covid times we have earlier covid times we have we had one funeral home which used to do it and and they were not doing it they were just taking it and burying it directly in five five pillars but when there is a situation where it is completely contagious what we do is we also don't know so we need to we check with our doctors we have few doctors around in our um, thing we find out is this really harmful or what and then there are some instructions given then we do it very lightly in cases where it's extreme things extreme contagious then we 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 do it very minimal you know we don't 
spend too much water and taking it, you know, just basic things like istinja, vudu and body bath. Or worst case, we have also seen bodies which are burnt or which have been lying in a home for 3-4 days, not taken care. Those we just run water, run water and we just fulfill the gusul obligation by just merely running water because he's not in the position to be, you know, um, mm. Uh, so those are extreme cases where we have just where are one or two cases, mm. but most of the contagious things we are able to handle it, um, and we we just make we make sure that we are cautious, and we also let everyone know that there is something like this. So we we want them to be to volunteer with uh, with Thank acceptance you. and not so so we also make it a point to see from the release forms if there is any kind of a contagious or the family members are I had to tell tell us that oh this person passed away with this virus you know that kind of okay. thing i have another question is that okay yeah. uh, regarding the pendant you, you said that we need to take off the pendant right so i saw like one person has like big surgery mm -hmm. and there is like big uh, pendant uh, around the bandage. stomach yeah bandage and then um if you take off that look like the bleeding will uh, come out. Yeah. So how to deal with that? Is it something that we can keep it or what is that? Yeah, so so in extreme cases where it's a possibility where a lot of blood can come out, it's a fresh and um, we we leave it. We, we leave with the bandage. We leave the bandage and then continue everything with it. Okay. You know, so we don't have to remove if it is going to be, uh, um, you know, getting all those, you know, and make it less invasive. Seal or whatever they need to do. Yeah. After that we can't do much. So we can't do much because we don't have the expertise and we don't have all the tools and the bandage and equipments to do it and we don't, we are not first aid trained or anything. Okay. So we tell the parents and the family to make sure they take care before coming here. Sometimes there are doctors present and they tell us how to take it out. Sometimes if there are tubes, we cut the tubes and we seal the top part of the tube so nothing comes out. So we are able to do a lot of things, but not, you know. And all with the consent of the family. The family is willing to do it and they take the responsibility. We don't have uh, any expertise on that. But we have a lot of bandages available and that can that we can clean up a wound and put a cotton and, you know. So with that said, uh, we are going into shrouding. Oh, sure. Oh, oh. Uh, during the steps when you're pressing on the abdomen, uh, how much force are you using when you press on the abdomen? Yeah, gently, gently, gently. See, we are, we are only turning him right and left. We don't have to press too hard. Okay. And some are very weak and frail. You know, we don't want to hurt hurt them as well. <laughs> so it is a very gentle pr pressure on the abdomen. So any kind of a a leftover can come out. Sometimes pressing a little, but more pressure also unnecessarily sends things more. from there. Uh, because if they are eating the last meal and then they die in between, you, the more pressing you do, the more waste might be coming or feces or something. You are actually making it happen unnecessarily. Right? So better not. It is just a gentle. Judgment, yeah. Judgment. It's a just gentle, but most of them are sick and they have not had, you know. They are on IV and you know, so we haven't seen those kind of a things. Yes. I've done several. I don't lift the body per se. I, when I press, I press very gently on the abdomen and I put my ear right, right next to the abdomen. You will hear a bubble, a gas, basically. Once that passes, I stop. Okay. I don't, my job is not to empty the person yeah. from inside. We don't my job, if, if there is anything stuck in between that, this process will help remove it. Once you hear the, the gas passes, that's it. Yeah. We don't have to do too much, too much of it. We don't have too much. And especially in case of coroner's, coroner's case, they, there is autopsy done. So generally the head is cut open and then the chest is chest is cut open till all the way and they are sewed and the sewing are like an inch away so there are a lot of gaps so we have to be cautious about uh, because if it is a warm 
if you put too much of warm water, it can make the blood come out. So we keep the temperature of the water low and uh, make sure that it is not too warm for the blood to come out. Earlier days, earlier days, we used to send it to a uh, to the funeral home to get it further uh, further uh, sewed closer. You know uh, that we are not able to do lately. You know we used to spend four hundred dollars and get it more closely done because the coroner's office they don't care. They just uh, they just sew it. So that is one other instance where we have to be a little careful and cautious. We don't press too hard. You know we don't have to. And in in coroner's case, most of the feces are already they cut open right many of them are already cleaned and they clean up the body so so i think with that said you had a question yeah um i was just going to ask is there any time of day in which washing the body is recommended or prohibited yes so the the cemetery here in bay area they don't open um, they are they don't they want them to be receive them by 3 p.m or 4 p.m uh, 5 p.m. winters the, the sunset is they want to finish up before the winter sunset so we all the instances the janaza prayer has always been most of the time has been after Zohar uh, one instances maybe one or two instances could be after Asar if the cemetery allows them to receive them you know we make sure the cemetery receives them we don't give gusul and put back in the freezer so one or two instances where it has happened during after Zohar between Asar but most of the instances the gusul is completed before zohar so the time is from 10 um, say 9 9 to it takes two hours one and a half hours to two hours a gusul so then you have, the family has ample time for you know a viewing you know um, secondly uh, the the timing for the alameda county to receive a, i mean every uh, deceased has to have a burial permit to bury them inside um, in, in a cemetery so the, the, burial, the burial permit is from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. is when they issue. But um, by 2 p.m. they are already issued. And um, we have to make sure on a weekend it's a two-hour window. So it's a very small window. So we start a little late. So it could be from 10 to 12 or in some counties or it could be 8 to 10 in some counties. So based on the county's window, we started a little late. That way we know the burial permit is coming or you know there is some problem. And the problem could be with the social security not matching the name or some misinformation or the person is gone and so so we can so we just time it in such a way so if if it happens in the morning we take it same day but if it happens after 10 it takes two hours to come in then the day is missed and it we go to the following day okay any other questions before we go to the shrouding so uh, to get a burial permit, you need to get a death certificate, I guess. No, no. Burial permit is the first step where uh -huh. all the all the name and social security and the address, everything match, and they go clear through the computers. Two weeks later, uh -huh. you get a death certificate. And the, so we, let's say we have a disease and we call in, yeah. right? And then you yeah. start with the whole process. So the process takes thirty minutes. So in the morning, you know the person passed away, just you have to make sure you have the social, if it is a 90 year old person, you have to make sure you have his social security and his parents name and address kind of a things because you just basically those are the information you fill up, fill up. So you have to make sure the basic information, social security, name, address, you know, matching of those are handy with you. Okay. On the day a person passes away, it takes 30 minutes to just fill up that, those form and you tell the funeral director to release on your behalf the deceased and they bring it to the masjid. Got it. Okay. So it's very simple, 30, 30 minutes and all website has access to all the information. We are there to pick up the call all the time. Imam, me or him, anyone can pick up the call all the time and we are quick. And second final, if uh, the disease, I mean, or the death happens like 5 p.m. Yeah. So what happens if it is 5 p.m. or midnight? Yeah. You still go through the funeral home the funeral home will still send a person within two hours to three hours. I mean, regular funeral home, not Muslim. So we have a Muslim funeral home called Khan Funeral Home. We have a few other funeral homes. Many of the American funeral homes, they don't have resources and they may charge more. But most of the Muslim funeral homes, they send someone. It could, it could delay a bit. 
and they will send it in two three hours time pick up from the home hospital or corners and bring it to the mosque midnight 1 a.m 2 a.m 3 a.m no problem so the, so this one is a cold storage so basically it keeps the the individual you know uh, you know from not uh, decaying okay thank you generally or or the funeral homes have have this kind of morgues and they can place them there funeral homes have it coroner's office have it hospitals have them hospitals don't have to release right away they put it in the morgue and then they release it to a funeral home and you give the permission to the funeral home to release on your behalf and they and they would hand it over in some instances the family would like to keep the deceased at home till the morning till 8 a.m because they have families coming from all over the place and the mom has been there in that house for so long you have all the brothers and sisters you can request the funeral home to come later and pick them up and sometimes and and 24 hours or I mean 8 16 hours nothing will happen to the to the deceased you know okay i mean is it advised uh, i mean some families have no issues and some families want to get rid of it sooner and because of you know but I have seen my own friends, families, members have been there at home. So what all we do is we make sure they are really old and uh, you know they are wrapped with white sheet, sheet and probably fans are running, and, you know. And sometimes they keep a heavy, heavy, heavy stuff on their uh, stomach just to not let it bloat, you know. So just to keep some weight, uh, weight onto the onto the stomach so that the stomach uh, doesn't bloat up and big become big. And uh, in the morning they come and pick it up. So it's not right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is whether they're going to do autopsy or not. Yes. Correct. So keeping the person at home is not recommended. Yeah. So at is, all. Yeah. You can bring them home after. They have been cleared, you can, but they have to be in the custody of the coroner or at least a phone call. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go over, yeah, a good question and good point, good comment. I'm going to go over that uh, in a bit after the, after the coffin, the shrouding, about the certain aspects of it, which is very important. What if a person passes away at home, you know, young or old or having medical history? So there are different cases. I'll go over them uh, after after the shrouding. Okay. Now shrouding, shrouding is kafan. We use the word kafan. Kafan is three piece of unstitched cloth. Huzur Sallallahu when he did his only Hajj in the last, there were people who passed away during the Hajj time and they were in ihram. So two piece of cloth, they were buried. Sunnah is three piece of cloth. And basically, if you look at the cloth, um, the biggest cloth is laid at the bottom, which is which is the um, what do you call the biggest piece of cloth? Chadar or something we call uh, name. What I don't know the Arabic name. It's chadar. It's the biggest blanket. You know that is. So it is just you see these are unstitched piece of cloth, and that is the bottom most. Okay. The the shirt or the kameez. The kameez is something like a rectangular piece. You can can you lift it up and show? It's a rectangular piece of cloth. You know, take it take out uh, full full. Take it fully. Can one of uh, you come here and just hold from one corner up, vertically down? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. No, 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 no. Actually, it's the other way. So if you look at the other way, if you look at it and facing the audience here. So basically, it's a rectangular piece of cloth. The top part, right, uh, could be the back piece, the back portion. So if you want to turn it around, yes, like this. See, the top part, right? you lay it down and then in the middle section you just cut it like a T that's where the head is going to come so the head and the buttons you know show, show, uh, Tamim, Tamim show that that will be the front part you see like how the shirt is right so when you lay it on the on the top so if you lay it down yeah, like this so the back cover back of the shirt and then you have a neck you see yeah that's how the face is exactly so it's a rectangular piece of cloth you do a cut with a T-shaped cut and that will become the kameez like a back, like a shirt, the back side and the front side. And we lay it in such a way 
that, yeah, we can lay it down here. Yeah, you can just cut it. You can turn it like this and just cut it with a scissor, the corners, and you will get that shape. You can do it at home, so it's not a big deal. Okay, so now he is going to lay it on top of the chadar. Um, so, so you see here the the bottom. The bottom is laid out, and this is kept on the. Uh, put this out. So this is kept like this, generally, so that you can lay the head first, and then you have the izar. Izar is the like a like the lungi. Okay, so so there is this piece of cloth to cover the bottom. You see, and it could be longer too, and you could make your own coffin and keep it with you, and whenever you want to use them, like you could. You could that is something is recommended to keep it ourselves. So now the coffin, we have dried up the individual and we place the head in such a way that the, the head is placed in that area that was cut. And at this point, the satar is still covered. You know, at no point of time, the satar is removed. The modesty is key. And we cover the, the top part of the shirt through the hole. So his top, front and the back is covered. So you can see how it is covered. And the satar is still there because we don't want to you know, undo the satar. Yeah. So now at this point, right, one, one thing that we do is we use sometimes uh, ether or something. So you know when a, a person prostrates in front of Allah Ta'ala, all the seven areas that touch the ground, you know, you have your forehead touching the ground, your nose tip and your right palm and left palm are touching the ground, the knees are touching the ground and the fingers. So those are the areas where we uh, anoint with uh, uh, ether or with the perfume. In this case, sometimes if you have a camphor, which is a little bit, we just make sure um, the individual is applied uh, in all those seven places. So you can just show a bit, just apply it. And then um, your uh, nose tip and then the right palm, the left palm is applied. And then the right knee without the satar, under the satar from the side, without the satar being removed, and the right knee, left knee, and the bottom of the of the fingers, toe tips. At this point, that, that completes it. And that completes it, and we remove with this covered. We remove the uh, the satar, uh, the, the 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 towel that is covering the satar. So everything is out. It's just just this uh, top part, and now we do the shrouding. I mean the shrouding part. So. What we do is the left side, the left side of the mayat, right? This, this is the left side that goes first and goes under him, goes under him, tucks him like a bed sheet. You know, like a, how a bed sheet gets stuck under the bed. We tuck it under on the on the, the left side, and then his right, the right cloth, the right cloth comes down and covers under him. So for men it is tightly done, for women it is loosely done, and women have five pieces of piece of cloth. So now we did the kameez and the izar, the shirt and the and the bottom. Um, so what we do is now the biggest piece is there, right? The biggest piece we cover like this and we hold it here, the excess. So this part goes under him. Now with the face is still not covered because it is required to be uh, for viewing. You would need the face to be uncovered to a point when the viewing is till to the point when the viewing is complete. After the viewing, we cover the face also. Now the right side, oh, and the right side goes under him, and I still have this piece, extra piece of cloth here. So at this point, you see this one tie ropes, there are three tie ropes, one by the leg side, one by the mid section, and one by the head section. So at this point, it would be a shoelace. So I would, since in, in five pillars, we just lower it, lower it down we don't need this excess but if you want to hold this this could be a good piece of things to hold and we just put a um, a kind of a shoelace the shoelace is such way that after the after the burial uh, after the symmetry thing we undo the undo the shoelace so we just a single or a double you see just so this one takes care of this you could sometimes do it with the extra piece the mid section and the and the top is also done after the viewing is complete so at this point, we just make dua, Allahumma kfirli hayyina wa mayyitina wa shahidina wa gaibina sagirina wa kabirina wa zakrina wa unsana Allahum man ahayaytahu minna fahayi ala al-Islam wa man tawafaytahu minna fatawafahu ala iman I recommend everyone to remember this dua, beautiful dua. Okay, 
So after the viewing and before the janaza salah, we do it, we do the tying of the head above his head. Don't do it on, on his face or neck, you know, we just tie it above the head. So, and this completes washing and shrouding. Kafam. You can lift it and lift it, or three people can. And while in the cupboard, he is placed in such a way that he is tilted towards the Qibla, like this Qibla, if the Qibla is this way, and then this one is undone. And then, uh, untie this and five pillars. Some people also put itar, and um, the, you can now kiss the, the deceased and it's very clean. It's, go, it's taken to a, a viewing area where a Quran is, can be read. Quran, all the women can read Surah Yasin, Mulk and you know, al Hakumutta Kasur and all those duas and send the duas to the deceased. So that completes washing and washing and shrouding. Any questions at this point? I have a few important slides to answer some of the questions. What happens if someone passes away at home? Those are some key things I want to discuss. With that said, grave, right? I just want to talk a bit about the the symmetry. The symmetry in California, um, um, right now the five pillars have, uh, the symmetry for five pillars are, the, does not take infants or child. You can't take, because it's full for infant and child. It's only for adult that's open. Um, any symmetry in uh, California has an outliner. You see this one is an outliner. Basically what is an outliner is basically a concrete outlining that is put into the grave. And this is for the earthquake and kind of a shift of the of the deceased to prevent a shift of the deceased during an earthquake we have an outliner and then it has an opening at the bottom and the bottom is you can see the mud at the bottom and then when you are when you put the deceased in and with the with the way you face it with the with the stone and and then and then we put three fists of mud into the grave and we recite uh, ayat of Quran, you know, minha kalakanakum, wa fiha nuyidikum, wa minha nukradan tarata nukra. Means we, we were made out of mud and we are returned to mud and we are raised from the mud. So we fill in three fists of mud and then the concrete top is laid and the mud is. So the cost in the cost at five pillars is um, $6,500 on a weekday. And 7250 on a weekend. That's the today's cost to to uh, use a five pillars symmetry. Basically, it is you know they have the cost for the grave, the site, and then you have the endowment fee, the grave liner, the concrete lid marker. They put a marker, five hundred dollars. Put a name and in a birth date and end death date, opening and closing. All this cost so much. Some uh, symmetry like lone tree, they need a wooden casket. They wouldn't let an individual be buried. So it's a $500 or $300 thin wooden casket is used to bury at lone tree. So that is that. Um, it's a difficult, uh, oh, for, uh, so this would be the process. This would be the process. Now I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about the process in a bit. Uh, natural death certificate. So you have, I mentioned about when a baby dies in the womb of the mother. So you have less than 20 weeks. Less than 20 weeks is a miscarriage. Okay, nothing is formed. No documentation, no burial paperwork is needed for any, any small baby miscarriage under 20 weeks. You don't need to do a paperwork. Okay. Anything over 20 weeks and above, you need a paperwork. You need to call a funeral home and release and, and, and release it. Even for a less than 20 weeks, you would still need a funeral home to release it. Some hospital says, I won't release it to the parent, but they would release it to a funeral home. The funeral home would charge a small fee to come and receive and give it to the parents. Okay. For these two, uh, the closest cost uh, we have is $3,000 in Lodai. Lodai uh, Cemetery charges $3,000 for an infant and uh, Sacramento 1800 there is no place in uh, five pillars um, so that is that unnatural death 
okay unnatural death so this is the thing i want to talk about what is an unnatural death um, if a person is not sick accident car accident a cop um, firing at someone uh, death by you know fire any kind of an unnatural death our doctors can't do anything okay our, our doctors can't do it if someone is if there's a lady at home and she passes away it's an unnatural death and so the first thing you have to do is call 911 and you have to let them know uh, and they are going to take them to coroners any kind of an unnatural death it's a obese woman a uh, 50 year old at a home at the night she was sleeping morning she woke up i mean she didn't wake up and so she passed away is an unnatural death on one condition if you know the victim who passed away at home has history of medical condition like lot of documents they have visited doctors often and there is a pile of high blood pressure all the time you could call the doctor and convince him and say that it is not an unnatural death and she had an and you can prevent you can convince the cop to not take them to coroners so that's very important for any elderly gentleman always make sure that you visit the doctor often and keep your medical records up to date so that that is something you can show to the cop and make sure that they don't take to the coroners because a doc, any kind of a, if you don't visit a doctor for say an year and someone passes away the doctor is going to see at his records and say i have not, i've seen him a year ago i'm not going to sign on on uh, you know sign him saying that i know him and this is the cause of death he he won't no one is no doctor is going to come forward and the reason is you don't know was it a drug was it a dui was it a something else was it a was it a, a domestic violence or was it a parent hitting a child no one is going to come forward no doctor is going to come forward and it's going to go to coroners if it goes to coroners the, the one thing you can do is you can convince them he is a muslim we don't take alcohol we are clean you know we this is he had a history of something you can convince a coroner not to do an autopsy but most of the time he is going to do an autopsy and he has to cut open he has to clean up the body internal um, body and sometimes the organs go missing as well okay so that is something but the anything happens at home the first thing you have to do is call 911 and let him know what happened and he is going to call coroners and the, and the body is going to get shifted to coroners now like i said if you have if you have uh, um if you have any kind of a suspicious death it's going to be coroner okay so updating medical records is important so if you have medical records like he pointed out a point where they won't let them keep but the the police will release them as soon as they know as soon as as soon as they know through a doctor or someone that it's an there was it it was at home they would let them stay at home or all they would make sure is the funeral director is contacted and it's up to you and the funeral director to make sure when you want to release the body from home but if the cop knows that it is suspicious he is going to call coroners and it's going to go there invariably you can't keep it at home but you have to call 911 if the parents are alone is another instances where a person can pass away for 3 days and you don't even know so don't let him you know be alone and students uber drivers always carry something with you like if you know someone just let them know that to carry you are a muslim you are this this person or a friend is aware because we have seen uh, uber drivers passing away at 2 am heart attack and they are um, they go to a san francisco hospital and it could be buried differently you know it could be a, a different could be even in it could be also a cremated you would never know so we work with the, all the hospital to say that we are there if you know so if so long as they carry id or anyone knows so he could be properly uh taken care and then embalming some people want them to ca- carry the deceased to subcontinents india pakistan but we recommend no because they have to do embalming embalming involves cutting open cleaning up all the fluids and filling it with formaldehyde formaldehyde chlorine all those they are cancerous uh, dangerous to the individual as well and even the burial too you know so so embalming and it can cost 15000 dollars to 20000 dollars to ship elsewhere so we say don't do embalming do it locally so these are some basic things the process we can we can go over the process basically 
basically whether the death can happen at home, hospital or coroner's. And all you need to do is contact a funeral home, contact us or anyone, we will let you know. And the funeral home will send a, a, a hearse to pick up from hospital, home or uh, from the coroner's and bring it to the Islamic Society of East Bay or any mosque that has a facility for Ghusl. And it is placed here while the hearse, while the hearse is working, while the funeral home is working for the burial permit, you know, we are giving Ghusl. And then after the Janaza prayer, he comes with the burial permit and the hearse takes to the cemetery. So it's as simple as that. It's, it's five documents. Two of them you are saying you don't have pre-need. Americans have pre-need arrangements. That means they have been paying for their funeral for 15 years, 20 years. We Muslims don't do any pre-needs. So we just say no pre-need. And we give the authority to the funeral home to pick up the deceased. And they get all the details like name, first name, last name, social security, um, area. And they submit it to the county to get a burial permit. Once you have a burial permit, you can go and bury anywhere of your choice. Five pillars. Yeah. You know the person is a convert. Yeah. Or immigrant. Sometimes they don't use their real name. Always ask for the passport. Because for the living, you can change your name anytime. Go to a judge. It happened to me once. The person known by a different name. When we issued the death certificate, it took us more than a year to change it, for the judge to change the, the known name because they have property outside the US. Their, their birth name was different. So always insist on the passport. Mm. True. True. And also sometimes Muslim names, there are four words in the Muslim names. You don't know which one is the last name, which one is the first name. It's good to know those because social security will de deny and things will come back. It will delay the whole ghusl especially in a weekend and things like that, you can't, um, so it can delay. And reaching the doctor too. So if you know someone who has treated, make sure the doctor is aware that the funeral home is going to call them to find out the cause of death. Just mere heart attack won't suffice. You have to, the doctor has to say what was the underlying condition that caused heart attack. And so the presence of a doctor is important because twice he is contacted. Once to get the details, second time to approve the information. So twice he is contacted. If he is away from home, from country, or in surgery or something else, that's going to delay. So it's good to tell ahead of time. Please receive the call because we have to, uh, because the deceased is waiting uh, to have his blissful journey of the hereafter, you know, as quick as possible. You don't want to delay. So you want to let the doctor know. Please wait immediately. We are going to you are going to receive a call, and we need to do it quickly today. You know, so we don't want to delay. No, your doctor is aware because he's his patient, and he he should be aware that he's he's dying or he's dead or whatever. You know, and you reach the so when you give the information about the deceased, you will also give the dead doctor's name and the phone number. So the funeral home is contacting that doctor. You are primary physician or a physician who treated treated him or who knows what the what the problem is so but while doing that there are some american doctors you know they may not know um, you know the process of the funeral the islamic uh, burial because christians take a week 10 days to do there's a funeral service and a memorial service you know they take a long time to do it unlike us we want to do it as quick as possible. No, 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 no. This one is something I wanted to bring it up. This is something new. Okay. So the website is MCC website has all the information. MCC East Bay has all the information how to how to reach. And our website has uh, Islamic Society of East Bay has a uh, thing. We don't have anything I could give you. You could, but the best way is MCC East Bay has a whole detail about that. Now this is important. I encourage everyone to know this one. This thing is, you know the cost of a, of a funeral, right? Is around $10,000. And in order to 
um, you know, many people cannot afford $10,000. So the best way is there's a new program or membership program called, uh, it's basically called Muslim Funeral Service USA dot org. And the beauty is, this this is the most important thing, and I myself am a member of this, this organization or this group, which is local here. And the thing that how it works is, and this is approved by all scholars, uh, Imam Tahir, it could be anyone. And what it takes to become a member is a one-time fee, I think it's $150 or $200 one time for your family. So one time, $150 or $200, and you don't have to pay any more. But so what it, how it works is, you have 300 people, 300 members, each one pay $200, so they have an initial bucket of $60,000 sitting with them. And any of the member passes away, any of the member who have registered passes away, they take care by paying $10,000 to the individual. But the key catch, not catch it, is every member like me will pay $30 for that debt. So if it is 300 people times 30 or $32, I paid once $32, it's almost $9,000. So all I am paying for someone's funeral is $32. I mean, four or five cups of coffee a month would take care of it. But he's covered and it's a sadaka too, to you know help someone in the funeral. So it, there is no, not, no other catch, but you may have to pay $32. But the more the members are, if there are 1,000 members, it is 9,000 divided by 1,000. So your cost will come down further and further and further. So the more members become, right now there are 340 members or so. But any old gentleman you have who is sick, let them know to go and register. You know, because $10,000 is too steep for anyone to pay. And there is no haram thing in this. It's very clean. Imam Tahir, our uh, Mufti Mudassar from Fremont, many scholars have approved this. They are a standalone. They can do it for any cemetery or any. They are not tied with any funeral home. All they do is give ten thousand dollars, and you can use that for the funeral of the deceased. All the condition is you have to become a member, and I'm a member as well. And it's a beautiful thing to go and check. It eases lots of pain, especially with uh, with funeral. Ten thousand dollars is pretty steep. So that is a good thing to join, you can take a look at it and share it with other people. You know. Many people come in and say, oh, the Hayward Masjid or some Afghani Masjid, I've become a member, but I didn't pay for it and they, they're not taking care of my uh, funeral thing. It's going to be, and my dad is too old and stuff like that. I tell them, go, just join. You know, It's simple, $200, you pay $32 for every death here and there, and you're good. So that's something I wanted to bring in. Now the infant and babies I mentioned already. No space in no space in five pillars. Lodai is costing three thousand dollars, and Lodai I mean Lodai eighteen. Uh, this is Sacramento, sorry. Sacramento is eighteen hundred. Lodai is three thousand dollars. And uh, sometimes our masjid helps needy people, unlike this. So our masjid and um, more so MCC pays uh, ten thousand dollars sometimes if needed, five thousand, four thousand. Our mosque also pays 2000 3000 So the masjid takes a donation of 1000 if you can afford. And and in that, $150 goes to the cleaning of the Gusul area. Uh, you know, you have to uh, you have to make sure it's clean. And So almost $150, $200 goes through that. Kafan and other things and maintenance, water, whatever it is. But invariably that money, the remaining goes for any needy people who need it. They get to have the money. So there's a donation. Uh, the masjid asks, but if they can't afford, the masjid waves it, so it's not a big deal. So these are the things. The process is very simple. 30 minutes before, you can go get it from MCC or anywhere. They have a Apple uh, iPhone app. All you have to do is fill the deceased name, uh, you know, first name, last name, doctors. And most of them are hospice care. So a hospice care doctor can take care of the, you know, the hospice. Most of them are hospice cares. So the doctor who was there is good enough to take care of the signing of the of the burial permit. So, um, what else is there? Any other questions? Or I think I have basically covered. Oh, like I said, um, if the doctor uh, any kind of um, issue with the baby in the womb, 
and uh, the doctor suggests termination abortion. Um, no questions asked in the state of California. But again, anything, I think there's a limit of 25 weeks. You can't go beyond 23 or 24 weeks for abortion. You will have to go to a different state like Utah, Utah or something. I'm talking about in a genuine case where the baby is uh, how um, baby is going to be threatened or the mom is going to be threatened because of that. And on that condition, all you need is a doctor's certificate and the symmetry will bury with no questions asked in the state of California. And we have seen a couple of cases where, in the recent cases where it has happened, abortion, and we don't need a permit for it. So those are the two things and then the regular case. That's it, I think that completes any other. It depends on the real estate planning, you know, like Americans, they need more. Indians, it's some, some, I mean, again, Americans, they want it to, if it is, Americans generally have an attendance of so many brothers, you have each brother have a death certificate. It's their need. I've, I mean, you, at the time of applying the document, you can say, or you can always go to Alameda County or in Contra Costa County and ask for more. So there is no, there is no hindrance in that. I, I think if there is an individual, they want to, I mean, one in a sibling could have it. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, bank requires one property. Yeah. So based on your real estate and the estate planning you do and where the need is, sometimes they may be getting social security and things like that. You will have to let them know or I don't know how they will come to know. Um, they'll get, you know, their social security gets stopped, stuff like that. So you could ask for any amount, and there's a fee, like $22 or $28 per death certificate. There you could get two, three, four, everything is a small fee. Coroner's charge like $300. Okay, you have a question. Yeah, uh, regarding the membership, is it only tied to California or any other state as well? They, they say any other state as well. And you can go to the FAQ and you can call them, and they are very, I know personally, Ibtida Kayum, and you know, they are open for any place in US, I think. You know. I mean, it's, it helps everyone. Any comments about organ donation cases? Uh, organ donations. See, I mean, if the DMV, um, the ID card has, I mean, we don't have a control. It is, it's a family, right? We just say organ donation is not uh, recommended. But uh, you have people with various thoughts of equal, you know, rights and rights of things. So people, if they have to, if they give, they will give. I mean, we can't. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't change anything, I guess. It doesn't change. It's already, already probably the organ donation has already done at that point. I have not seen many instances because Muslims are very, especially, we are still immigrants here in Bay Area. You could have probably seen something more in Texas area where they are third generation or second generation, but largely in Bay Area where I am a first you know, generation and, and from 90s. So I have not seen many, but there are, you will going to find more, more like that. You know. Oh, and the instances where I have seen, oh, lots of these where the dad and mom, both are not Muslims. Okay, this is, an, uh, this is an, uh, just an interesting thing where they have a child and the dad wants to do it uh, the Christian way and the mom wants to do in the, the Muslim way. And so I encourage non-Muslims. So non-Muslims are not allowed to give gusul, you know, according to madhabs. Again, you have to ask your scholars. So I or we personally recommend them to come and, and see and see the gusul even if we don't tell them and they may not be willing to participate but they know but by doing so right I have an instance where we said okay the mom and dad have agreed mom will do it the the gusul the islamic way and the dad would do the casket and burial in the in the church and in those instances two or three of instances where i've told the dad to come in and uh, see the gusul and he would get transformed. And sometimes it would also help him change his mind to go to an Islamic cemetery. 
because the kind of modesty and the cleanness and the things like what we do, it just amazes him. Most of the non-Muslims, it amazes them that, my, I mean, this is the kind of respect we give to the deceased with the modesty and, and, the, and, the, and the way we do it and the way we treat, treat them. And that brother, I think eventually they went to an Islamic uh, cemetery and uh, buried, uh, buried them. But those are the instances where, you know, the dad and mom are from different faith. Um, and you will not also not believe uh, there are brothers who have who have been um, um, siblings. You know, they they fought their life, like they have, they fought their lives. But when when such a death happens, they come and they feel for their brother. And I've seen. Um, I mean, this is just some kind of a thing that I would like to share. Is that the the brother comes to his ear and says, "Oh, these are the three questions asked in the grave: Mar Rabbuka, who is your Lord?" And you know, what's your religion? And and Manabhyuka, who is your prophet? He is reminding his dead brother. You know, you have to answer this way, this way, this way. Just the figure of the figure and the concern of the brother to the deceased. You know, you can see it. And that's where I sometimes I feel less. You know, we shouldn't be. We should, you know, always. You know, it's our blood that's running in our siblings. So we shouldn't find way reasons to not. Uh, you know. <laughs> away from the families, but I've seen many people for the figure because the questions are asked. The questions are asked, you want to talk about it. Basically, the cover, in, the, in the grave, the, because we have some time, so the questions are asked. It's not your tongue or mouth that is going to speak. It's your consciousness, it's your conviction in your heart that's going to come out and say, you know, Rabbi Allah, Deen Islam, Islam is my religion. These are very important. Because we take it for granted, especially youngsters, we take it for granted. What the big deal to answer those three questions? But there is repercussion not answering those three questions. And sometimes, sometimes that would the youngsters would question, what's the big deal? You know, someone is dead, he's dead. You know, is there any life after it? You know, there are a lot of these questionings and atheistic behaviors we see amongst the youngsters, but there is a big consequence not answering those three questions. But before coming there, Answering those three questions are good, you know, so long as we do khidmat, we do help, we help the community, we follow the commandments of Allah, not miss our salah, make sure we take care, you know, in this dunya, and help all the needy people, Allah will open the doors to answer those three questions, and also die in the state of Iman, you know. But when you don't answer those questions, there are repercussions, there is uh, what you call, uh, uh, what kind of a, you know, um, Azabe Kabar, you know, uh, what do you call in English? Uh, punishment in the grave, you know, punishment in the grave if you don't answer those three questions. You know, the interesting part is every night when we sleep, we are going in the state of temporary death, right? We make dua, we say, Allahumma bismika, amutu, ah, Allahumma bismika, amutu wa ahya. We also say that way, right? We say, in the name of Allah, this means amutu means die and 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 so once you go in, the ruh comes out of the body, and if Allah wills, He'll bring it back when you, when you when you are awake, you know. And when we when we get up, we also make the dua. Uh, what kind of dua? Make? Alhamdulillah, lazi ahayana badma amatana. You know, oh Allah, thanks for giving us life after death. You know, so those are important things to remember that every night we go through temporary death. <laughs> and uh, if Allah chooses, we are back uh, in, in our life. And so, so there is an analogy given for this uh, punishment of grave, right? You go through emotions and you go through dreams, wet dreams, youngsters, you know. You go through emotions and then you wake up and you see, oh, nothing, everything is fine. But you go through pain and emotions and that's what we have to think about azab cover and so there is a consequence in the grave if you are not in a position to answer those three questions mar rabbuka rabbi allah ma dinuka deen islam and man nabiyuka nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam so once you answer those three questions it's a blissful journey to the hereafter with you know you have heard all those hadiths about how the door to the the jannah is opened up and it's a blissful journey so with that said i would like to conclude and uh, any other last minute questions?
Uh, Tamim can answer also. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're going to touch on this, but what's the process to start volunteering now that we've done the workshop? Uh, so if so, the easiest way is if you know anyone in your family or friends, or you know, you, the first thing is MCC sends out an email, right? Someone passed away, just to reach out to them, the family members, and you can join with them, and you can say, oh, I know this brother, I would like to come and participate. The family, the first thing is family. <coughs> Otherwise, you can contact him or me, but I don't know how you would reach me. You could reach me through MCC website. Uh, you can get Abdul Rahman's number. And you say, or sometimes the family might not take you. You know what I'm saying? The family might be close. They may say, I have 10 brothers and sisters and we have uh, enough. So they are not, they may not even going to welcome, welcome additional members. But most of the times, there are family members, uh, they need help. So you are more than happy to contact that way. Or if you, even if they don't allow, right, we would let you in. You can do the kafan and you can take the ajar, you know, before we start, you can just leave. We are open for that. We have a limited of eight to 10 people in the room. We can't take, but we can take turns, you know. So anytime you are welcome through the website or through the family, you can join. You had a question? Assalamualaikum. I just, how many ghusl facilities are there in the Bay Area? Um, um, there are many. There are many. Um, if I know, to, to what I know, MCA Santa Clara has one. Um, Lauri Majid, Islamic Society of East Bay has one. Oakland. The Oakland Islamic Center, I know Brother Hatim is, has one, but the facility... 31st, huh? 31st Street. Yeah. yeah, but the facility, the room is not... It's very small. Yeah, and it is not... Uh, uh, it's not, uh, it, you know, a room should have a ventilation and um, basic things that are missing there. So, Tracy is building one. Tracy Mosque has a, is building one. I know uh, Brentwood, Brentwood brother um, uh, Hamid, brother Hamid Jan, right? Uh, Masood, Masood Jan, uh, Brentwood. He, there is a facility in, so what we do, right, when we get called, we get calls from all over the Bay Area. So we try to hook up with the closest, closest um, facility that is there, Antioch and other things. We would send them to Brentwood, to San Francisco, we'd send them. But many people are local. I mean, you see the large population, I think, in East Bay and Pleasanton and, you know. So Pleasanton also avails from, avails uh, uh, Fremont. Um, I mean, Pleasanton can have themselves one facility. <laughs> See, having a, having a facility, all it needs is the basic things, ventilations and basic drainage systems, water, clean room. You don't even have to have a morgue, you know, and you tie up with a funeral home, uh, 60 miles, you should be able to do it. The one in Islamic Society of East Bay, it was built as part of the permit. The facility was built in 2002 or 2005. If the permit was signed for that facility, you know. Tracy has one, uh, it's still not commissioned. There is one in Alameda, um, uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq Masjid in Hayward might have one. There are a few Afghani brothers who do it, but most of the other, other mosques, they come to Islamic Society of East Bay. <coughs> Which one? Yeah, full capacity, so they have it. But then uh, the Muhajirin Masjid, they use uh, Islamic Society of, yeah, they use Islamic Society of East Bay and they also use Abu Bakr, yeah. They also have a membership concept, so they try to avail that. But I would encourage this one that I showed is very good for everyone, you know, because it's too expensive. So uh, I, I spoke to, for this uh, stillbirth, I spoke to um, Chapel of Chimes, in, uh, it's a cemetery, Chapel of Chimes on Mission Boulevard. For an adult Muslim, there's a Muslim uh, de uh, designated uh, cemetery. They charge $16,000. There are many Muslim brothers have a allotted sp spot in uh, uh, Chapel of Chimes Mission. They have a tendency that if, if the father uh, passed away, the mother likes to be next to the father, kind of a concept, you know, and they're willing to 
and uh, that's um, so that kind of a thing they charge sixteen thousand dollars for a, a designated muslim only uh, thing and for a child they might say in that spot it could be eight thousand dollars it's too steep you know just also for those kind of things like loan tree and if you have a chapel of chimes you need to call ahead of time they will say okay someone passed away today they will say sorry we we don't have the 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 plot ready give us four days time so if a person is sick and he's almost terminally ill and you know it's going to not be more than so much you want to tell them ahead of time and have the grave ready even five pillars five pillars on a friday evening someone passes away and i want to saturday morning they will not do it starting this year they say you have to let us know early because they can't find the the people labor to come and dig on a weekend and they have a fixed schedule eight hours every day and so you have to prepare them ahead of time and so we had a couple of instances where we couldn't do it on a saturday sunday at five pillars uh, the question was uh, uh, symmetry like five pillars may not take an individual on a weekend if you have not told them ahead of time and the reason is uh, unionized labor or especially these things we have noticed after pandemic a lot we have seen shortage of laborers and high cost and that's true with everywhere you know not just and you can't find on a weekend to come and work or dig and they want their rest day earlier they used to work four hours like the brother zaki and other people in five pillars used to work limited hours for seven days but now with the change in management they are doing eight hour shift monday to friday and they don't want to come on a weekend so unless they are told even though they are over uh, they are paid over you know over over an hour uh, rate overtime rate all right i think that concludes any other questions and hope it was beneficial <laughs> and you are free to come any time and join us I'm more than happy thank you assalamu alaikum jazakallah have a lot of experience <laughs>